I'm Joe Reed, and this is the download from Audiophile Magazine. From the harbour, the port of Alexandria is an attractive sight. Its white walled houses and red tiled roofs framed by azure sky and sea. Since I had been there many times, I knew that the walls were disfigured by dried mud and rude graffiti, and that the streets were inches deep in evil smelling debris. I never arrived in Alexandria without wishing to leave it as soon as possible. That was Barbara Rosenblatt reading The Painted Queen, the final installment in Elizabeth Peters' best-selling Amelia Peabody series. Written by real-life Egyptologist Barbara Mertz, under the pen name Elizabeth Peters, the series centers on the adventures of fictional Egyptologist Amelia Peabody. Through 20 books, we follow Amelia, her husband Emerson, and an ever-increasing number of family, friends, colleagues, and villains as they explore archaeological digs in Egypt and the Middle East. Spanning the period from 1898 to 1993, the novels take mystery, mixes it with gentle Victorian parody, and serves it up in a wryly comic tone. And they found the perfect reader in Barbara Rosenblatt, who is the voice of the entire series. When Barbara Mertz, or Elizabeth Peters, died in 2013, she left a partially finished Amelia Peabody manuscript. Mystery writer Joan Hess completed it with great wit, care, and respect. And the final book of the series, The Painted Queen, was published. And read, of course, by Barbara Rosenblatt an experience she found bittersweet. Even doing the corrections was bittersweet, because I thought, oh, is that the last correction? Is that the last thing I have to drop in, sounding like Radcliffe Emerson that last time? Because, I don't know, there was a swallow or a little glitch in the recording, and, and you know, I would look plaintively through the glass at my engineer who would look at me and go, yep, you're done. I said, really? Yep, it's over. Really? <laughs> really? I tell you, I was at the brink of tears at the end of the correction session mm -hmm. to make sure that every last moment of this book was clean and done and perfect and thought through. And uh, <sighs> Whenever you do a, a, a series, a long-lasting series, and I've done so many over the years, but this one obviously is close to my heart, it's like slipping into a pair of comfy shoes. What was the first Peabody novel you did, and, and how long ago was it? Uh, I think it's The Last Camel Died at Noon, I believe was the very first one. That's my recollection, but after 21 of them, I can sometimes get them out of order. Now, how did you get the Amelia Peabody series? I was at Recorded Books at the time, which uh, really was the first major commercial company that I worked with as a recording artist. Prior to that, I was working for the Talking Books for the Blind with the Library of Congress. And that's where I learned my craft, really. And while working on various things at Recorded Books, they came to me with this wonderful tale of a young English woman looking after her dad, who had a huge fortune that he leaves her after she's looked after him throughout his uh, late-in-life illness. And she takes the money, follows her bliss, goes off to Egypt, meets the love of her life, Radcliffe Emerson. As I have often said, and never tire of saying, my husband is the greatest Egyptologist of the 19th century, of the Christian era. And although the present century is still in its infancy, I do not doubt he will dominate it as well. And 21 titles later, she's a grandma. Now, that publication date was in 1975. Mm -hmm. um, how soon after did you do the audiobook? Oh, about 15 years about later. About 15 this years was later. a series. Yeah, it was a series that uh, recorded books found uh, and enjoyed and dropped in my lap <laughs> and said, uh, oh, Rosenblatt, you're going to enjoy this. I said, why? Oh, because there's a million dialects and it all takes place in Egypt and it's, you know, 19th century and the characters are all English. You're going to have a blast. There's Arabs, there's Indians, there's Germans, there's Swiss, uh, you name it, French, it'll be fun. 
oh, be still my beating heart. That's the kind of thing I, I cleave to when uh, offered an audio book. But this particular series, I thought, was, was just so rich with stuff that I had a, a lovely time. And you and Elizabeth Peters, or Barbara Mertz, became really good friends. How did you meet? Yes. Somebody had mentioned to Elizabeth Peters that uh, her book had been recorded, and she sort of reared back in horror because she, ugh, she couldn't even listen to an audiobook. No, no, please, no. In her fabulous home in uh, in Maryland, and one of her author buddies said to her, yes, but it's, it's, it's Barbara Rosenblatt, you know, tune in. And she did. <laughs> and she listened to the whole thing. And she sent me this long, delicious letter about her uh, her hesitancy to listen. And now she's a fan and blah, 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 blah. And I was uh, so touched by that. I framed it and hung it up on my wall at home. It's been around since, it's been there since 1992. And I was on Broadway at the time with uh, The Secret Garden. So she got a hold of me uh, through her publishers and said she, that she'd love to meet me because she was in town. And I thought, oh, great, I get to meet this woman. Terrific. So on a matinee day, we arranged to meet. She came with two of her editors, and I was still in costume. <laughs> and there she was. And we fell on each other like long-lost cousins. Hugs and kisses and, okay, when are we going off for cocktails and smokes? <laughs> we became fast friends immediately. And over the years, she sort of became a surrogate grandma to me. I've stayed in her home. We've collaborated on some of the work. So many of the Amelia Peabody books were written after you had begun narrating the series. And I wonder if if Elizabeth Peters slash Barbara Mertz sort of had your voice in mind after a while. She began to have great trust in me because with every ensuing book, knowing that I hung my hat on my ability to do dialects and accents and whatever, she would make sure that there was at least one chaotic moment where you would have a German and a Frenchman and an American and whatever all at the same table, perhaps a dinner in Shepherd's Hotel with some Arab rushing in, you know, and I had to be all of them, including all the he says and she says recorded in the moment. And that made me so happy. So yes, uh, she had told me on numerous occasions that as she was constructing her latest edition of this series, my voice was in her head. I would think it would be. I even collaborated a little bit on The Painted Queen. Yes, tell me more. Uh, I was with her for a weekend, and um, we were sitting in her lounge, and <laughs> she was saying, well, Barb, you know, she's got a martini in one hand and a smoke in the other, and we're chatting away like gals, you know, broads. And I'm just having a little hard time with some of the sequencing of the conversation on this particular page, and I'm not sure about. And I said, well, do you want me to read it to you? She said, would you, Barb? I said, sure. So she pulls out the pages, and uh, I started to read what she had typed from The Painted Queen, um, which is probably the first time in audiobook history that uh, the audiobook recording artist read live part of the book before it was even finished to the author. <laughs> but I bet it was enormously helpful. And she went, oh, that's great. Now I get it. Yes, yes, this is great. And so I said, you know what you're going to do now, don't you? She said, what? You're going to take these pages, you're going to rip them off your Xerox machine, sign them, and give them to me <laughs> as a present. And she went, oh, of course, of course. And she wrote on it, for your very own, from your biggest fan, kiss, kiss, hug, hug, etc. Barbara, Elizabeth, and Ethel, and Flitworthy. And anyone who's read the book will know who Flitworthy is. And the Ethel part is that she is Barbara Mertz and Elizabeth Peters. So I always called her Ethel. Oh, as in Ethel Mertz? Yes. So whenever she sent me a Christmas card, she would sign it, best Ethel, and in parenthesis, the other Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> I loved that woman. A day doesn't go by when I don't miss the heck out of her. Friendship is so precious in any case, but then to have a collaboration on top of that must have been so gratifying. 
it was probably one of the most wonderful aspects of the work that I do. And I'm a, an actor and a recording artist and a singer, and I do all these things. But this precious friendship that we have, you know, a Sunday morning would come and she'd call me up and we'd chew the fat for two hours about whatever, her family, mine, what's going on. And uh, I'd call her when I didn't understand something uh, about uh, a, a new Amelia book that I was going to do. And uh, and I would suggest something and she'd say, oh, yeah, let's try this, let's try that. And let me let me answer that for you. She was just so caring and thoughtful and helpful that it was probably one of the most wonderful relationships, professional and personal, that were that came together uh, with such warmth and poetry that I hold it near and dear to my heart forever. That's lovely. I'm curious. I really want to talk to you or have you talk to me about process because you've done these over a number of years and these characters are aging and most particularly the younger generation. I mean, her son literally grows up throughout this series. It's fun when you know that these kids are going to grow. The process of audiobook narration is airbrush work. And recording, because you are seducing your listener one pair of ears at a time, they can't be assaulted with trickery and magic what you're doing is creating a world. You're channeling an author and an author's intent. So when you have a young character that slowly begins to grow, you find the fine elements of this child, boy child, man child, and you let the author be there with you because, in fact, you are collaborating it in every uh, in every sense with with the author as you move along, and that's why you do all this preparation. So if you imbue these people with the characteristics that the author gives you, then as they age and as, they, as their quirks begin to appear, you layer on with airbrush strokes aspects of their personality through breathing and timing and dramatic pauses and volume to keep your listener centered on where you need them to be to follow through with the rest of the drama that's unfolding. Does that make any it sense? It does make sense. I thought you did such a fabulous job with Ramsey's voice. I mean, particularly in The Painted Queen. I could see him. As he got older, I began to picture Prince Charles. <laughs> ah, that's interesting. <laughs> and so what I, I, I found in him that uh, allowed me to just uh, bring him to Ramses so I could say, thank you, Mother, and thank you, Father, and uh, <laughs> let's, let, let's go off and, uh, to Luxor <laughs> and see if we can find some more proof of this murder. <laughs> I apologize for startling you, Mother, Ramses said as he bent down to kiss my cheek. He nodded at Emerson, who had not yet consumed enough coffee to be civil. I arrived late last night and decided not to wake you and father. As I have come to expect of her, Fatima had my room ready for me. It is always ready for you, said Fatima. She clutched her hands together and gave him a broad smile. Fatima set an overflowing plate of eggs and toast in front of him. Where is Nifret? Ramses asked. Here, she announced from the doorway. Good morning, Aunt Amelia and Professor. Ramses, it's good to see you again. And you too. He rose and gave her what I perceived to be a perfunctory hug. He held her chair for her, and she took her place at the table. Eat, Fatima urged. You are too thin, Ramses. You were born in the UK. Where were you raised? I was born in London, and as a small child, I was um, brought over by my folks to New York City. And I was a baby at the time and uh, grew up in New York City, in Manhattan. And then after university and a couple of dreadful dinner theater shows, I decided to go to England on the pretense of being a guest at a wedding of some friends of the family. But then while I was there, I thought, you know what? I'm a citizen here. I have dual nationality. Why don't I see if I can get a job? 
or something. And I was young enough, and uh, so that's really where I started my professional career. And I was there for about 14 years, working in the West End and doing the Edinburgh Festival and television and voiceovers. My first audiobook, which is still terrible. And uh, yeah, and then I just, and then I came back. How did you discover your path as, as an audio performer, as a, as a voice performer? When I was very little, my uncle David showed up with this big box, like a attache case that would hold an Uzi, that kind of a thing, a metal box, right, which I'd never seen before. And I thought, ooh, Uncle David, what's that? And he was a nice Polish fellow. He says, look, Barbara, I'll show you, I'll show you. And he opens it up, and what's inside but a real to real tape recorder, which I had never seen in my life. And I'm, what, five years old? <laughs> and he turns it on, and it goes, boom. And I think, oh, that's interesting. And he looks at me and says, tatala, tatala, say something, say something. So I take the mic, and, and I went, Hi, I'm Barbara, and uh, I'm with Uncle David, and I'm five years old. And he turned the thing off, and he played it back. And I'm hearing me back. And in about 10 seconds, I discovered show business. After that point, I, I couldn't wait to get back in front of that microphone. And many years went by before I had that opportunity. Um, when I got to college, I got through my first radio course so I could have a radio show at uh, City College WCCR, Radio 640 on your AM dial. <laughs> I, would I would record commercials, anything. I loved playing with my voice and creating characters and doing stuff like that for years and years and years. And fortunately, I was able to, to turn this into uh, bills paid over the years. You know, talk about developing accents, because you do it so well. It can often, not often, but it's not unusual, let's put it that way, for accents that you hear to move into a bit tongue-in-cheek or mockery in some way. And I think that's, that's a line that is very easily crossed that you never even come close to. That's why I'm always using the word airbrush. Um, if you start to load your characters and your dialects uh, with stuff that is, how shall I put this, over the wall, you begin to separate yourself from your audience. This is an incredibly intimate medium, and you have to be respectful of it and respectful of the microphone and respectful of the process and respectful of the author, which means you need to do your homework so that once I have digested a novel fully by reading it slowly, underlining stuff I don't quite understand, collaborating insofar as how do you pronounce this? Is it right for this book or is it a an author choice? And if so, how does that impact on what happens in the book? With a loud exclamation, Emerson dropped to his knees next to the excavated area and took a brush to clear the object of the remaining vestiges of sand. As you see, Peabody, it was not finished. The surface is unpolished, and the faint vertical line from brow to chin indicates that the sculptor intended to continue working on it. Von Raubritter could not constrain himself from displaying superior knowledge. This is part of the workroom of a sculptor named Futmose. I was told that Herr Borchardt was euphoric when he came across an ivory horse blinker amidst the rubbish. It was inscribed with Futmose's name and a job title as official court sculptor of Aknaten. You have to be incredibly prepared before you, you um, enter a studio because there is many a slip twixt mic and lip. <laughs> and... And, uh, you know, that's the responsibility of that voice, because I don't know about you, but I think within five minutes you can lose your listener, probably even less than that, if they're not instantly engaged and feel comfortable enough that they want to stay in your company for six, eight, twelve, twenty hours. That's a long time. I would be remiss not to mention your stage and television career. Aww. 
probably most recently your f- most famous role on TV is Miss Rosa on Orange is the New Black. Can you tell me how you develop the character of that memorable, memorable character who probably has the best ending I've seen? You could have knocked me over with a feather when I figured out what they were going to do with her. I was originally up for Kate Mulgrew's role as Red. and They hadn't cast her yet, obviously. So I went in and I worked real hard and I did this audition and the casting director looked at me and said, how is it we've never met? (laughs) And I said, what? And I'm thinking, it's not for want of trying. (laughs) Um, But she said to me, we're going to get you in this prison one way or another. (laughs) And a couple of weeks later, my agent called me up and said, "Uh, they'd like you to play this character called Miss Rosa. I said, oh, (laughs) who's this? Oh, she's a prisoner. Okay, what did she do? We don't know. Uh, How long she been in? No idea. What's her last name? Not a clue. (laughs) Oh, and by the way, if she's uh, dying of cancer, will you shave your head? Ah, I stopped and thought, hmm, what do I do the rest of the week? Play Daddy Warbucks in Annie? All of this was so new, so new. I walked away, and eventually they came back and said, no, no, we're going to get a three-time Emmy Award-winning special effects makeup artist Josh Turi to do a bald cap, which is what he spent three hours every morning at half past black. Are you kidding? You didn't shave your head? No, I never did. Oh, my God. Um, It was amazing work. Amazing. But once I got into that, that first morning, and I'll never forget, it was a very cold morning. I had coffee in my hands. I finally woke up, and he says, okay, we're done. And he's airbrushed me within an inch of my life. There were even fake eyebrows. And I threw that prison dress on, and I looked at myself in the mirror and thought, okay, kid, let's create Miss Rosa. And she didn't do very much in season one. As I do with every audiobook, I let the writers inform me by looking carefully at the clues that they were giving me to find and to wrench from within my gut who this woman is. And so I slowly formulated her being, her inner life. And that inner life is what had to appear in my eyes, at least, whether I was speaking or not. And I had done five episodes in season one. um, And at the very end of it all, I thought to myself, boy, I hope they have me back. Be careful what you wish for. (laughs) And season two came along and Man, that changed my life. Season two was amazing. It's astonishing the effect that it has had on viewers now, worldwide, actually. I understand it's a different animal, but can you compare at all the process of working on a television set and acting with not just your voice, but your face, your body, and working in a booth where everything is the voice? It's probably the hardest work in the world. I don't think anything tests an actor's chops more thoroughly than an audiobook. A well-wrought, well-thought-through, beautifully organized, well-written, and finally well-recorded and post-produced audiobook. And that's because there are so many aspects to it. So many areas of preparation that we discussed earlier that finally bring a book lifted off the page into this new place so that like someone reading a play and then finally seeing it on a stage for the first time, but not from a high school drama group. And trust me, high school drama groups are where a lot of talent come from. But I mean on Broadway, well cast and thoroughly and beautifully directed. It's a step up from the print where your brain does all the work and your brain makes all the decisions. When I bring an audiobook to life, or at least I try to, it's because I've thought the thing through. You don't have to think, how do you pronounce that? What's that South African dialect sound like? You don't have to imagine those things because I've digested it for you. And so, a bit like a concert pianist, I don't compose the music, I interpret it. That's a great analogy, and I think that's a great place to stop. Barbara, thank you so much. And not just for this interview, but truly, for hours and hours and hours of (laughs) fabulous storytelling. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time, Oh, not at all. Thank you, Barbara. 
That was Barbara Rosenblatt talking about audiobooks and narrating Elizabeth Peters' final Amelia Peabody book, The Painted Queen. You can find reviews about The Painted Queen and hundreds of other audiobooks at audiophilemagazine.com. This is the download from Audiophile Magazine. I'm Joe Reed. Thanks for listening.